to avoid any confusion in our study of electricity, you must first understand that there are two theories. The first, the oldest theory, the pioneer theory, states that current flows in one direction while your electrons flow in the other. This has been Franklin's old theory. The modern theory of basic electricity, the theory that we will use for the next four years, states that electrons and current flow in the same direction. Your Lineman's Handbook uses the pioneer theory. We will not use this section. However, your book, Electricity 1 through 7, uses a modern theory, and we will use this for a reference. The first step in our study of basic electricity is in the understanding of matter. Matter is anything in nature which has weight and occupies space. This pen is matter. My tie is matter. Matter can be found in nature in three different forms, a solid and a liquid and a gas. All matter can be broken down into atoms. Atoms are the basic component that make up all elements. There are 92 natural elements in nature and they can be classified as to their atoms. atoms. An atom is the lowest form that you can reduce an element down to and still be identifiable to that particular element. Now let's take a closer look at an atom. We stated that the lowest form that you could reduce an element down to and still be identifiable to that element is an atom. Now the atomic structure then of all the elements are different. If we would go to the table of elements, we would find there an atomic number for each particular element, starting out with one hydrogen and going on through our elements. We want to take a closer look at the elements. Well, let's take an atom and break that atom on down to its three elementary particles or subatomic particles. The subatomic particles will be the electron, which is negative, the proton, which is positive, and the neutron, which has no charge at all. It's neutral in charge. We are not particularly interested in, in the neutron. Now, the atomic number, as I say, will determine what its atomic structure looks like. Now, I'll be showing you a table in a little bit, but let's take an atomic number for aluminum. Now, aluminum, which has an atomic symbol of Al, has a plus 13. In other words, the atomic number of aluminum is 13. Now, we stated that there will be protons, which are positive, electrons, which are negative, and neutrons, which have no charge at all. Now, those are the subatomic particles that will be in all atoms of all elements. Now, the structure of our atoms is such that we have a nucleus in the center. And the atomic number of an element determines how many protons will be within that nucleus. In other words, I'm going to have for aluminum, I'll have a plus 13. That would be 13 protons. Now, a, a neutral atom will have just as many electrons orbiting around the outside as it will protons on the inside. Now, another thing is that we said we had six protons within the nucleus. We also have neutrons in there, and like I say, we aren't particularly interested in those. Now, the protons are positive, the electrons being negative, 
the electrons are three times the size, but only one, 1,845th of the weight of the proton. So the proton is quite heavy. In fact, that's what holds that those protons within that nucleus is their, is their weight. Now, the electrons that orbit around the outside of this nucleus have ring structures. In other words, there will be a ring, and we call that a shell, and the first shell can only hold two electrons, so I would put a two uh, electrons in this first shell. Now, it will completely orbit around the outside of this nucleus. Now, in the next shell, we can, we can have eight in the next shell. The, the, first, the first one can only hold two. The next one can only hold, uh, hold eight. Now, if I was to break, break this shells down into subshells, you would see that I would first have two in a subshell. Then in, in the next subshell, I would have six. In other words, two subshells make up the second shell of this particular uh, element. Now, you'll see if I start counting, I've got two, and then I've got eight, I've got ten. Now, as I go on out to the next shell, you'll see I'll have two, then I've only got one left over, so I'll have one uh, electron orbiting around the outside of this uh, nucleus that's uh, in the outer shell of, of the atom. Now, like I say, this, this, these are energy levels. We can only have 2, 8, 18, 32. This is the way you would move out on, a, on, a, on an atom. Aluminum is not as good a conductor as copper. If I would show you an element such as copper, if we would look up copper, you would find that we would have 29 for an atomic number, and copper, the atomic symbol is, is Cu. If I would draw this ring structure out, you would see I would have plus 29 within the nucleus. So I'll have 29 protons within the nucleus. If I show the energy levels on copper, you'll see that I'll move out. I'll have, I can have two in the first shell. I go on out, I'll have two and then six to make up the next shell. And then I'll go on out, I'll have two, I'll have six, and uh, then I'll go out one more, which would be 10, you see. Now, if you'll look at that, you'll see the subshells uh, move out by four additional electrons as they move out. Now, see, I have two. I add on to that for the next shell. Now, I go two, add on to that four, four, six to make eight all together in that shell. Then I go two, six, ten, and uh, to make up the next shell. Now, if you'll see, I go on out, I have... I have used up 28 of my proton, so that means I have one more electron, and in this case, it's on the outer shell. Now, this outer shell, or what we call valence shell, determines whether an element is going to be conductive or non-conductive. If I have an element that... Uh, say has one or two, three maybe, in the outer shell, that could be a good conductor. This valence shell, like I say, determines whether it's a conductor or a non-conductor. If it has few in number, it'll be conductive. If it has a large number and yet not enough to complete the outer shell, it'll tend to want to take on uh, electrons which would then make it make it a, a non-conductor then. In this situation, we have an element where we have the electron at a quite a distance away from the nucleus, and so that this attraction between our protons and our electrons 
is quite weak to where this electron out here can be dislodged from that atom and move through our material. This electron is, is that portion of our atom which will move through the circuit and makes for our current flow in the circuit. Now, if I have unlike charges, there's going to be an attraction. Now, Coulomb's law states that unlike charges attract and like charges repel. The reason this electron stays close to this particular uh, nucleus of that, of that atom is that we have electrons which are negative, protons positive, so it has a natural tendency to want to stay in orbit. In other words, a neutral atom is going to have just as many protons as it does electrons. Now, there's another force here which tends to want to cause it to uh, stay at a distance. In other words, instead of colliding or c coming back into uh, the nucleus, it'll tend to want to stay away, and what holds it away is a centrifugal force. So there's two forces that, that hold an electron in a specific orbit. One is Coulomb's law, and like charges attract, and the other one is centrifugal force. The centrifugal force of the electrons around that nucleus uh, tend to hold it away. However, it's at a far enough distance away from the nucleus to where an external force applied to that could cause it to move. Now let's discuss some of our other conductive elements. We worked with aluminum. We worked with copper. Now let's discuss silver. The atomic symbol for silver is AG. It has an atomic number of 47. We said copper was 29, and we said that aluminum was 13. The larger the atomic number, and the fewer the electrons on the outer shell determine how conductive it's going to be. 